Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Christopher Porco? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. In 2004, Peter and Joan Porco lived in Del Mar, New York, which is about 15 minutes west of Albany. The couple had been married since 1974. 52-year-old Peter worked as an attorney and his 54-year-old wife as a speech therapist. The couple had two sons, 23-year-old Jonathan, who served in the Navy, and 21-year-old Christopher, who was a college student at the University of Rochester. People who knew the family thought of them as typical. They seemed happy and normal, but not everything was going well. Peter and Joan had concerns about Christopher's behavior. A few examples. Christopher had stolen two laptops from his parents in November of 2002 by staging a burglary. He did the same thing in July of 2003 when he took one laptop from his parents' house. Posing as his brother Jonathan, Christopher sold items on eBay. Christopher had a great deal of debt and forged his father's signature to get a car loan and a $31,000 loan to pay for college. And Christopher was failing out of college. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, so you can savor summer flavors right at home. Choose from over 55 weekly options featuring seasonal, pre-portioned ingredients picked at peak ripeness. Skip the grocery store and spend more time soaking up the summer fun. HelloFresh Market is a one-stop shop for all your mealtime needs with quick breakfasts, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant or grocery shopping. HelloFresh fit and wholesome recipes make it easy to eat well without sacrificing flavor so you can maintain your goals and feel good about your food choices. HelloFresh is the first carbon-neutral meal kit, and nearly all packaging is recyclable. HelloFresh recipes include pre-portioned ingredients that mean less prep for you and less wasted food. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code DRGRANDE16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. That's up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. HelloFresh.com, DRGRANDE16. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. At about 10.30 p.m. on November 14, 2004, Christopher climbed in his yellow Jeep Wrangler and departed from the University of Rochester campus. He drove about three and a half hours to his parents' house, arriving just after 2 a.m., now on November 15. He parked his Jeep in the driveway. Christopher used a key that was hidden in a flower pot to gain entry into the house. At 2.14 a.m., he used a master code to disable the alarm. Later, he smashed the keypad, but this did not destroy evidence that the master code had been used. Christopher made his way to the garage and retrieved an axe. He entered the master bedroom where his parents were sleeping. Using the axe, Christopher attacked Peter by striking him in the head and chest multiple times. He then attacked Joan using the same method. He placed the axe at the foot of the bed and left the bedroom. At 4.54 a.m., Christopher cut the phone lines in the backyard. He then drove back to Rochester, arriving just after 8.30 a.m. What Christopher did not know was that both his father and mother were still alive. Not long after Christopher left, Peter climbed out of bed and walked into the bathroom. He then walked downstairs and entered the kitchen. He walked around aimlessly there, for a few minutes. It appears as though he tried to empty the dishwasher and may have been preparing his lunch for the day. It's almost like he was engaging in his regular morning routine. At one point, Peter opened the front door. Eventually, Peter collapsed at the bottom of the stairs and died. When he failed to show up for work, a court officer was sent to his house. The officer called 911 after discovering Peter's body. When the police arrived at the house, they found that Peter was dead, but that Joan was alive in her bed. She was severely injured and could not talk. 
At this point, the police had already developed this theory that someone close to Peter and Joan had attacked them. There was no forced entry into the house, and nothing was stolen. A police officer asked Joan if a family member did this to her. She nodded yes. He asked her if Jonathan was responsible. She shook her head no. He then asked her if Christopher was the attacker. Joan nodded yes. Joan was taken to the hospital. She survived, but sustained many permanent injuries like losing an eye and part of her skull, as well as having severe disfigurement to her face. She could not remember who attacked her, and she did not remember implicating her son to the police on the morning after the attack. The police interviewed Christopher for six hours at the police station. He denied being involved in the attack. He said that he was in a dormitory lounge all night at the University of Rochester, which is about 231 miles away. This didn't make the police any less suspicious. Christopher's alibi did not check out. Surveillance video captured his vehicle both leaving and returning to the university campus. And, of course, his mother had initially indicated he was the killer. Almost a year later, on November 4, 2005, Christopher was arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder. Christopher's trial started on June 27, 2006. The jury started deliberating on August 10 and returned their verdict in less than six hours. They found Christopher guilty of second-degree murder and of second-degree attempted murder. Members of the jury would later say that the timeline was convincing and Christopher's alibi was not. They said the fact that Joan initially implicated Christopher did not play a role in their verdict. They completely disregarded that event, believing that Joan did not know what she was doing. In December, Christopher was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. He is eligible for parole in December of 2052, when he would be around 79 years old. Christopher appealed his case a few times, but was not successful. A made-for-TV movie came out in 2013 on Lifetime, titled Romeo Killer, The Chris Porco Story. Christopher filed a lawsuit to stop the movie from being released. He wanted to have editorial control over the movie. He had an initial victory in his lawsuit. Apparently, the judge wanted to get in on the homicide action by murdering the First Amendment, but on appeal, Christopher lost, as he should have in the first place. Now moving to my analysis. Was Christopher Porco actually guilty of murder? Many people, including his mother and a number of his friends, believe that he is innocent. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Christopher is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Christopher's mother initially indicated to the police that he was responsible he routinely lied to his friends at college. Christopher had stolen items from his parents and sold them on eBay. He forged his father's signature to get money. He lied to his parents, telling them that the university was paying for his tuition because a professor had lost one of his final exams. Christopher forged transcripts from a community college to be admitted to the University of Rochester. Not long before the murder, Peter was quite upset with Christopher because of his deceptive behavior. Christopher's alibi did not make sense or check out. He said that he moved his vehicle off campus, wandered around for a bit, then went to a dormitory lounge to go to sleep. Why didn't he go to his room to sleep? No one saw Christopher on the campus. None of his friends remember him being in the dormitory lounge on the night of November 14 and 15. There was a great deal of evidence suggesting that Christopher had driven his yellow jeep, from Rochester to Del Mar and back to Rochester. Video showed his jeep leaving campus at 10.30 p.m. Six minutes later, it's captured heading east. At 10.45 p.m., he picked up a toll ticket for the New York Thruway. A toll collector testified that he may have seen the jeep at 1.51 a.m. at a toll booth which was nine miles away from the Porco family residence. At 4 a.m., a neighbor who was driving to work noticed Christopher's Jeep in the driveway of the Porco family house. At 5.12 a.m., his Jeep entered the New York Thruway, heading back toward Rochester. And at 8.30 a.m., video captured the Jeep headed toward the college. None of the video captured the license plate, but decals and a mud stain 
matching his vehicle were visible. Christopher knew the master code for the alarm, where the house key was hidden, and was aware of the axe in the garage. Whoever entered the house was intent on killing Peter and Joan. Drawers were pulled out as if somebody was looking for something, but nothing was stolen, as if the assailant was trying to make it look like the intent was burglary. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. Christopher's mother said she did not remember what happened. She was positive that Christopher was innocent. She testified on his behalf during the trial. Joan was severely injured in the attack, and any gestures she made to the police could not be considered reliable. No physical evidence tied Christopher to the crime scene. There was no blood, no DNA, and no fingerprints anywhere in the house or in Christopher's vehicle. How could he attack two people with an axe and not get any blood on himself or in his Jeep? It's worth noting that Christopher worked in a veterinary office, and people there said he was very good at cleaning up blood. One fingerprint was found near where the phone line was cut. It did not match Christopher. It is possible that after Peter was injured, he entered the master code into the alarm, although this is unlikely, and it doesn't make sense that he would smash the keypad afterward. It is also possible that he put the key in the front door lock. Weeks before the attack, Joan reported seeing a stranger in the driveway. When considering the evidence in this case, do I think that Christopher was guilty of murder and attempted murder? Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and guilty in reality. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Christopher appears to have characteristics of narcissism and psychopathy. As far as the narcissism, he told members of his fraternity that he was from a rich family and had access to a lot of their money. He said that his grandmother was a wealthy landowner in Connecticut, his parents owned a lodge in Vermont, and they had a house in Aruba. None of those statements were true. Christopher used to show off his supposed wealth by paying for parties at the fraternity, but of course he was in a great deal of debt. As far as the psychopathy, prior to being killed, Peter told a co-worker that his son was a sociopath. Christopher was willing to attack his parents simply to cover his lies. It's almost like the lives of his parents did not matter at all to Christopher. He did not even view them as human beings, rather just as obstacles to him getting what he wanted. After the attack, Christopher showed no remorse. Item number two, Christopher's mother still believes that he is innocent, and she regularly visits him in prison. She's not willing or able to view him as the person who attacked her. Members of the jury hope that someday Christopher will be honest with his mother, but I don't think that's going to happen. I wonder what Christopher is thinking when his mother visits him in prison. I imagine that her presence there is a reminder of Christopher's failure to kill her, not only because she's physically visiting him, but also due to her highly visible injuries. I doubt that Christopher feels guilty or ashamed, but rather angry at himself for not finishing the job. He probably wonders why he didn't check to make sure that his parents were dead. At the same time, Christopher may take some comfort in the visits. He might gain pleasure in the fact that he was able to attack his mother so viciously, yet she still believes him. She is both a testament to his failure and a testament to his success as a master manipulator. Now moving to the final item, item number three. One of the most disturbing and unusual elements of this case was Peter's behavior after being attacked by his son. He seemingly went into some type of autopilot mode and attempted to execute his morning routine. He had sustained severe head trauma and was not aware of his injuries or what he was doing. This automatic behavior parallels the relational processes which are evident in this case. Peter needed to believe that Christopher could be redeemed. In his last email to Christopher, Peter said that he paid for his tuition and Peter appeared optimistic. He said this even after telling a co-worker that Christopher was a sociopath. At some level, Peter rationally understood that Christopher was a dangerous criminal, but emotionally, he was not ready to accept the truth. Joan had her own version of autopilot. Prior to the attack, she told Christopher how his behavior was causing Peter to have a nervous breakdown. Rationally, she understood that Christopher's behavior was a problem, and she was 
displeased with him. Yet, after the attack, she believed that her son was innocent. Like so many other cases involving offenders with narcissistic and psychopathic behavior, Christopher took advantage of people who believed in his goodness despite the evidence. The trust that parents have for a child is profound and sometimes adopts a persistent trajectory, which no amount of frightening behavior can disrupt. Those are my thoughts in the case of Christopher Porco. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.